mysteries, life is full of them. Even the things that we think we know, the deeper we dig, the more questions we seem to have. This mystery, and the first of many on this YouTube channel, is about the brutal murder of a young woman, only 19 years old, named Ethel Allen. This all took place many years ago, in the year of 1934. For people who take everything on face value, Ethel was murdered by a newly met stranger that was in town temporarily, and that's all it was, that simple. For those who dig a little bit deeper, this story starts with a man otherwise known as the Jersey Devil, as well as many other names. So let us dive into this together. I will not make the promise that I have the answers to all the questions that I will ask today, but I would like to invite us all to dig a little deeper and discover the mysteries beyond. Subscribe for more and check out my main channel, Everyday Legends, for street interviews and other fun, interesting topics. The Jersey Devil is primarily known for being the cryptid creature that has been allegedly seen in New Jersey. There is another who shared this name in the early 1900s, and this person was named James Willard Horton. This man used aliases such as Ralph Graham, William Wilson, Roy Barton, Mr. McLeese, and many more. Willard Borton was like a chameleon, moving from place to place, creating new identities and new lives. But one thing remained constant. He committed serious crimes wherever he went, and lots of it. He is suspected of murders and convicted of burglary in amounts north of $22 million when you convert it to our money in 2024. I have put together what I believe is the most complete timeline anyone has ever made about this case. I will steer away from providing excess personal opinions, but I will do my best to present all the information I have compiled through the many weeks of research. All links will be in the description below, and if there is any interest I can provide my personal Excel file showing the entire timeline. Note that I will refer to Willard Borton many times as Borton throughout this video. On February 8, 1901, in a small town of New Jersey, Willard Borton was born, and this is where our story begins. From what I have researched, I believe this to be his actual home, shown here. Property records show this was built in 1890. I have blurred pieces of the image to protect the privacy of the current owner. Not much is known of Borton between 1901 and 1911. But in January of 1912, when Borton was only 10 years old, he became a town hero to more than 100 witnesses of his extraordinary bravery. Borton's brother, Herbert, and his friend, Emily Clements, had gone to Lake Clementon in New Jersey to ice skate. They were both about 150 yards from the shore. They were trying to test the thickness of the ice to see if they were able to ice skate that day but the ice was too thin for their combined weight. Both fell into the frozen lake, struggling to get back onto the ice. Willard Borton, who was there as well trying to help, risked his own life to save his brother and the girl Emily by going to the edge of the hole they had fallen through. Because of his efforts with the direction of the construction builder who came to help, both Herbert Borton and Emily Clements survived and everyone involved in the rescue was okay. The next mention of Borton occurs later the same year, in 1912, in July. Borton was reported to have gone missing from his home for two days. His parents were understandably concerned and worked with the police to search for him. According to the article, it says that his parents almost fainted when he showed up the night before, showing no effects from his absence. He refused to say where he had been. I have tried to find information on where he went, but with no success. I think this is very significant, because as you will see, starting with the next event, this is when Borton kicked off his life of a long criminal history. Who was he with during these two days? Did this person or persons influence him to start his life of crime? Was he preparing or even practicing strategies of burglary? I highly doubt that he was simply spending time with his extended family like 
his family suggested in the article, which leads us to the next event in the timeline, which happened in September of 1912. This is the first publicized event that I could find showing Borton committing significant crime. I think it's important to point out that Borton at this time is only 11 years old. Him and a boy named Richard Williams enter pleas of guilty to burglarizing a string of stores in Atlantic City, New Jersey. The amount of loot they secured amounted to $500. When converting that to 2024 money, that equates to about $16,000. Not only was the amount significant for two young boys to have stolen, but the way they did so was with, quote, methods as thorough as the most expert cracksmen. They entered the stores by smashing rear windows with padded milk bottles, using their caps to smother the noise of the broken glass. Were they practicing and perfecting this method during those two days that Borton had disappeared two months earlier? No one will ever know. For the next two years, Borton did not appear in the local newspapers, though his father alluded to the boy continuing to commit crime. This is where the story gets a little strange. In December of 1914, Borton's father decided to, quote, risk his 14-year-old son's life in a surgical operation in an effort to cure the boy's criminal tendencies. This was a maneuver that his father sought in order to convince the judge to withdraw the sentencing that was before Borton for committing several robberies in the area. The operation involved removing a depression in Borton's skull, which was found on an x-ray examination. His father is quoted saying, I am convinced that my son's actions have been influenced by this depression in his skull. When he was six years old, his head was injured, and his waywardness dates from that period. He then said, quote, I believe he does not know right from wrong. He said that specialists had determined that the boy is not a criminal, and his father was certain that this operation would fix him. Borton ended up having the operation on his skull. In an article from December of that year following the operation, it says that the operation to reform Borton was an absolute success. It says, Borton now looks out upon the world, a youth with hope and confidence, ready to turn a dormant talent for good music and mechanics into good service. And that after the operation, he quote, immediately became normal. I read about many other attempts to perform this operation on other deviant youth, and I could not find a truly successful case. Despite what the newspaper clippings report, Borton was not fixed. Quite the opposite. He would continue his life of crime the rest of his life. It is a little mind-blowing looking at these operations from the perspective of someone in 2024. Did this cause any resentment in Borton? Could this have intensified his crimes? Could this have been the fuel that drove him to crime after crime, eventually leading up to the alleged brutal murder of Ethel Allen in Rockledge, Florida? I am not saying this to justify anything Willard Borton has done, but admittedly, this had to have been a horrible thing to go through when he was only 14 years old. It is my personal belief that not only did this operation not fix Borton, but it gave him more of a reason to continue to commit crimes, each worse than the last. So, we just discussed the 1914 events. The next thing in our timeline has nothing to do with Willard Borton at all, and it occurred February 1st, 1916. This was the day that Ethel Allen was born. Now, Ethel and Borton will not have met until the year 1934, but there are some events that occurred prior to the meeting that I consider relevant to the overall understanding of Willard Borton's criminal development. In September of 1919, Borton was charged with manslaughter. A man named Frank Conroy had been killed in a car accident. Borton had given the police a false name, this time it was Bennett, again with his aliases. It was alleged that Borton was operating the vehicle that had killed Frank Conroy. In 1921, Borton robbed three Sewickley Heights homes in Pennsylvania. Today, this is still one of the wealthiest areas in Pennsylvania and in the entire United States. He stole about $9,000 worth of jewelry and furs. 
This equates to almost 150000 in today's money. Later, in April of 1924, in Florence, Arizona, Borton had received a one-year sentence. I'm assuming that this is similar to his past crimes of burglary. It is said that he decided he was not going to serve his whole one-year sentence, and instead broke out on September 14, 1924. He then returned to Philadelphia, where, in April of 1925, he was given three to six years for entering with the intent to steal. He did not escape this time, but he did manage to only serve three years, returning to public life on May 26, 1928. His life of cleanliness did not last long, however, because in June of the same year, not even one month after prison, he was in Ohio and was charged with embezzling $400 or about $7,000 in today's money. After this long list of criminal activities, I thought I'd add a humorous event that happened on April 20th, 1929. Borton, under the alias of William Borton, accused two men under oath of stealing his $34, which is about $600 in today's money. Warrants went out for the two men's arrest. I thought this was absolute peak irony. After everything this man had done up to this point, he later said that the two that he had accused were his friends and that he had made a mistake. Then, a little bit later, in December of 1929, Borton was arrested in Philadelphia for burglary under the alias of Willard Martin. He was only discovered of being involved because his accomplice had left shoe prints that the police were able to identify and link to him, which eventually led to evidence implicating Borton. Less than one year later, in June of 1930, Borton and his accomplice, Samuel Mortu, decided to impersonate Prohibition agents. When the person being robbed objected, they struck him with a blackjack. This is actually a very dangerous leather weapon at that time, and he was robbed of $8 or about $140 today. From what I could observe, he then goes a couple of years without anything showing up in the news. That two-year streak of crime-free living came to an end in October of 1932 when $2,000 worth of stolen jewelry was discovered with the arrest of Borton in Washington, D.C. In May of 1934, Borton had found himself in the Ocean County Jail in Toms River, New Jersey. He had been picked up by the police in Borton's own restaurant under the alias of William Wilson. According to the article that I had found, it says, an accomplice Ernest Schaubacher confessed to a series of 14 safe robberies in 1933 and 1934. It was said that Willard Borton was part of his gang. According to another article, he, Willard Borton, had also had murder charges against him, which he had escaped prison in order to evade, and was implicated in a Daytona Beach, Florida diamond theft. While in jail, he managed to escape. There are two theories to how he accomplished this. One is that Borton used an iron bar from the head of a cot in the jail to escape. Police said they believe he broke the padlock from his cell and climbed through a window. A fellow prisoner in the jail reported that Borton had said to him, quote, When I get out, I am going to see the people who squealed on me. The prosecutor of Ocean County at this time, Prosecutor Leo Robbins, was not satisfied with this theory, however. The other theory is that Borton did not do this alone. This is when our second character comes into the story, Willard's wife, who, based on one article she was mentioned in, I believe her name to be Helen Borton. I was able to find a little bit more information about this incident, and this event actually took place the morning of May 25th, 1934, and it says in the article, the day he broke jail, Borton was visited by a mysterious woman now believed by police to have been his wife. Not much is known about her and her true involvement with Borton's criminal activities. Because of this lack of information, I will try not to speculate too much, but if you find any information about her, please put it in the comments below. And now we come to the final event that I could find that involved Borton prior to his meeting of and alleged killing of Ethel Allen. On August 22, 1934, 
Borton was being pursued by police in Philadelphia. Borton forced a police car to the curb and made an escape. Do you know where he was or what he was doing between this time and the murder of Ethel Allen in November of 1934? Comment down below if you do. I searched and searched and I could not find anything. And now to the purpose of this video, the tragic mutilation and murder of Ethel Allen. I want to be very clear that even though it is my opinion that the person responsible is likely to have been Willard Borton, it was never proven in a court of law, and thus Ethel Allen's case is technically unsolved. And because of the age of the case and the lack of physical evidence to test, it is unfortunately unlikely to be solved. Ethel Allen will likely never receive the true justice that she deserves. And as we respect the justice system of the United States, Willard Borton is innocent until proven guilty. There is little information to be found about Ethel Allen. She was born on February 1st, 1916 in Wachula, Florida. It does not appear that she was involved in crime or any wrongdoing, but instead was your typical, joyful, active teenager, enjoying life, experiencing new adventures, going through personal challenges, partying with friends, and living every moment like it's the last. Unfortunately for Ethel, I do not believe she had any idea that in November of 1934, these would truly be her last moments in this life. Ethel must have been going through a challenging time in her life in 1934. It was reported that she had left her home in Wachula to go to Coco, Florida only three months prior to her murder in August, which is also precisely when her boyfriend was killed by a freight train accident. I have tried to find information on this accident and her boyfriend, but nothing turned up. If you know anything, please comment down below. As fate would have it, in the same month, probably close to the same exact day, Willard Borton again appeared in some news clippings under his infamous nickname, The Jersey Devil. This time, he wasn't robbing someone, but was instead eluding the police. As the story goes, Borton was the operator of an alcohol drop in Philadelphia. Borton made the quote, dramatic escape when he forced a police car to the curb and then leaped from his car and fled on foot. I'm not sure what Borton did after that. Did he lay low for a bit? When did he meet up again with his wife? Did he take a train to Florida and his wife meet him after? Again, if you know anything or are able to find anything, please comment down below. When I first began to investigate this story, I found it fascinating. All the different events I was able to discover and the timeline I was able to construct. Despite this fascination, this was the only part of the many weeks of research that I did not enjoy. And that is because I am going to explain the details leading up to the gruesome murder of Ethel Allen, as well as the murder itself. Many of the details I was able to find shows just how cruel and soulless her killer truly was. Between Saturday night and Sunday early morning, Ethel was reported, according to some sources, to have been last seen at Jack's Tavern in Rockledge, Florida, which would later become Ashley's Restaurant, and it is still in service today. I found more reports documenting what I believe to be her final sighting, and this was at an Acme packing facility. I thought this part of the story was a little strange. It is reported that Ethel was out drinking with his newly met stranger, William Wilson, who, of course, was actually Willard Borton. Then they both had returned, together, back to her boarding home she had lived at. There, Ethel's friends who lived there said that Ethel told them that she had to go to the Acme packing plant to say goodbye to her brother Jimmy. What's weird is that she did not have a brother named Jimmy. I will come back to this. So Ethel and Borton drove to the Acme packing plant Keep in mind that this is all happening Sunday morning around 3 a.m. I researched where this could have been and the only remnant I was able to find was this. It's an Acme branded packing plant in Cocoa, Florida, the Sullivan Packing Company. I believe this to be the place. The building was built in 1928 and actually I used to drive past it every day when I went to work. I never knew the significance of the building until I investigated this case. It is reported that a car drove up to the furnace room door of the packing plant and that Ethel was going to talk to James Sheely. 
She told Sheely that she was leaving to go to her hometown of Wachula with Bill. Allegedly, this was William Wilson. They were reported by Sheely to have talked about half an hour. When she had left to go back into the car, Sheely did not see the driver, but he heard the car start up. He said that it sounded like the starter and engine sound of a V8. Wilson, or Borton, was reported to have owned a Ford V8 during this time in Florida. Was Jimmy a name that Ethel used for James Sheely? If it was, why didn't he disclose this to the police and the media when he was telling the story of her meeting with him at the packing plant? If he wasn't this Jimmy, is there another person she went to go see that night apart from James Sheely? Regardless of who Jimmy was, why was it so important for Ethel to go see James Sheely at 3.15 in the morning prior to going on her supposed road trip to Wachula with the alleged Wilson? What did he mean to her? Is there something she told him that he did not disclose for whatever reason? Is it possible that James Sheely was involved in her brutal murder? Was he a boyfriend or secret relationship? Could this have been a crime of jealousy? Since this is an unsolved case, I think anything is up for speculation, but I want to be clear that James Sheely was never considered a person of interest from what I discovered in my research, and this is purely speculation. It is assumed that it was sometime Sunday that Ethel was murdered. It was also reported that Borton's wife and son left the day of the alleged crime or just before, so I am not certain that there was any involvement from them or knowledge of the alleged crime. It was also reported, which I thought was very strange, that Borton had purchased an FEC, and this is the Florida East Coast Railway, train ticket for Jacksonville, Florida, returning on that very afternoon that Ethel's body was discovered. It is reported he purchased the ticket, not that he actually traveled on the train. So a few questions to ponder on. Did he actually go to Jacksonville, Florida? Why Jacksonville? Why did he go and come back? Is it possible that he was concealing or disposing of evidence that would have implicated him in Ethel's murder? Was he meeting with his wife or with someone else? Maybe a former partner in crime? Was him simply buying the ticket a diversion for the investigating police? Was he betting on them focusing on finding him in Jacksonville while he packed up his belongings and fled from Rockledge, Florida? It just seems a little strange and not a coincidence or a pre-planned day trip. Plus, when you look at Borton's past crimes, it was clear he was intelligent and was very good at evading the authorities. I am convinced that he had a reason for this. If I had to guess, it was a diversion for him to buy time to clean up any evidence and get his affairs in order and go into hiding outside of Florida. It was November 21st, 1934 in the afternoon. The badly decomposed and mutilated body of Ethel Allen was discovered by three men in a truck heading north. They had seen buzzards soaring ahead, which drew their attention to the body. The body wasn't identified until that evening. The identification was made by a tattoo mark on the right thigh above the knee, which displayed a rope circle enclosing the initials BK and the yellow gold ring set with a ruby that Ethel wore. Now I'm going to describe the body that was found. If you would like to skip this part, please skip to this timestamp here, as I know it can be a little gruesome and uncomfortable. According to the reports, Ethel's body had marks of extreme brutality. Her throat had been cut, wounds were found on the forehead and at the base of the skull. The right side of the face had been crushed and the upper teeth and part of the jawbone was entirely gone. One leg was almost gone because the murderer had attempted to dispose of the body by burning and throwing it in the river. The report also states that only a small patch of hair remained on the back of the head. The only clothing on the body when the three men found it was a piece of stocking around the ankle of one foot. The police never were able to identify where exactly Ethel was murdered, mutilated, and burned. One report I found proposes some chilling questions about how the murder may have escalated to this point of brutality. It states, Was the girl murdered in a car? Was she struck a blow by a man? 
and then began to make noises that would attract attention, causing the man to hit her another blow, stunning her. Becoming panic-stricken for fear that the girl would make another outcry, did he cut her throat and stab her in the neck to keep her quiet? Or was the girl killed in some house with other people knowing what was done? Were there efforts made in the house to remove traces of identification and later her body burned and thrown in the river? At what point was her body thrown into the river? Who killed Ethel Allen and where? I found one report that said the body was found on the shore of the Indian River north of Ogali near Rocky Water Tourist Camp. I believe this to be very close to the spot the body was found. As mentioned before, a day before the body was found, Willard Borton had gone by train to Jacksonville and had come back the same afternoon they discovered Ethel Allen's remains. Neighbors of Borton's reported seeing him with his car backed up to the cottage door, appearing to be packing up his belongings. They also reported seeing a roaring fire in the fireplace, although the weather was not cold. What was he burning? Evidence? Clothes? His or Ethel's? Or anything that might tie him to the murder? The very next morning, the officers discovered still cool beer in the icebox and a number of burned vegetables and other debris in the fireplace. No other clues were reported that could have connected Borton with Ethel's murder. And just like that, Borton was gone from Florida. Why did he go to Florida in the first place, specifically the Rockledge or Coco area? How did he become involved with Ethel Allen? Was there a motive behind him creating a relationship? Or did it happen by chance? Did he kill Ethel Allen? And if he did, why would he do so? Did she have high-valued art, jewelry, or other riches that isn't reported publicly? What purpose would he have had of killing a young girl if his crime history showed he consistently was involved in theft, safe hacking, and robbery? I think it would be unfair to consider that maybe he was not the one who killed Ethel Allen. Could his wife have discovered their relationship and got jealous? Was it an associate of Borton's? As all this information that I am proposing is nothing more than evidence and not proof, meaning that I have provided materials and information giving weight to the possibility that Willard Borton may have killed Ethel Allen, but this is not conclusive proof or fact that he murdered her. Despite this, I do find it too coincidental after observing and creating this in-depth timeline of all the moments leading up to Ethel's murder that I think at a bare minimum Borton must have known something that would have led police to solving her brutal murder and bringing closure to her family and loved ones. Just because Borton had booked it out of Florida in the middle of the night, for whatever his reason was, it was not the end of his criminal infamy. Far from it. In December of 1934, only one month after Ethel's body had been discovered, we see Borton start to pop up again in the public's eyes, but this time in Hollywood, California. In Florida, his main alias was William Wilson, the name that Ethel used to introduce him as to her friends. Now he had taken the name of Ralph Graham. A fun random fact that I had found when I was looking into Borton's family history is that his grandfather on his mother's side was named John Graham. Probably a coincidence, but still interesting. I do wonder how Borton developed his aliases. All seemed quiet and crime-free until Mr. Borton, or should I say Ralph Graham, was probably running low on his bank account funds and decided to do what he did best. In 1935, in Bel Air, he burglarized a home and made out with $3,000 worth of jewelry. This is about $68,000 in today's money. Talk about a lot of money for one night of work. With paychecks like that, why would he stop? Well, Borton must have thought this as well because he continued. Matter of fact, it is reported that he actually burglarized the same exact home again after he had hoped they had stocked back up on the jewelry that he had stolen originally. To his great benefit, they had indeed done this. He made out with rings, bracelets, and other jewelry totaling $4,300 or $98,000 in today's money. 
His next hit was actually a well-known multimillionaire at the time. His home being empty, Borton was able to break his way in with little effort. He found bonds worth of $1.8 million. That is $41 million today. Fortunately for the rightful owner of these luxurious bonds, they were non-negotiable, meaning that they could not be transferred from one party to the next. So to Borton, they were actually worthless, or at least they would have been, but he was able to return them for reward money of $2,500 or $57,000 today. Not bad earnings when you consider he returned to the rightful owner the items he had stolen but couldn't profit off of. It is reported that his favorite method of getting into these Bel Air homes was with the use of a swordfish gaff that looks a little bit like this. Now, security systems and door locks were a little different in the 1930s, but with this tool, he was easily able to sneak right into the upper, less protected windows of homes. Though he burglarized a number of homes in the 1930s, many being Hollywood film stars' homes, one caught my eye. This was the actor Gary Cooper, who starred in one of the best Western films of all time, High Noon. Needless to say, after so many high-profile burglaries going unsolved and this criminal receiving the infamous title of the Phantom Burglar of Bel Air, police were getting a little frustrated as it went on for four years. They started to lay traps and watch pawn shops in case Borton was trying to get rid of the stolen items. They even regularly switched out officers patrolling in their private vehicles so Borton wouldn't get suspicious. Nothing truly worked until the only thing I could find that Borton's downfall was when he chose to rob a quote, honest man and was trapped and arrested. When police went to search Borton's residence for stolen goods, they discovered a grand piano, refrigerator, typewriters, movie cameras, projectors, and plenty of jewelry, which were all stolen. The police estimated that he was involved in 85 burglaries the jewelry alone was worth $375,000, which is about $8.2 million in today's money. A third of that suspected amount was never truly recovered. Understandably, it appears that at this arrest, the police also looked into Borton's wife and son. According to the report, officers were satisfied that neither Mrs. Charlotte Graham this, of course, was an alias, real name I believe to be Helen Borton, the burglary suspect's wife, nor his stepson, Robert McLeese, age 21, were aware that Graham's home was furnished with articles stolen from the homes of film stars. I find this a little hard to believe, but again I am doing my best to present just the facts, without interjecting excessively. With that said, ask yourself how would you not know that your husband or father was up to something a little shady after 85 burglaries in your area and random extremely expensive items showing up at your home. Not to mention the many times they moved around the US and their swift and coincidentally timely departure from Florida around the same time that a young girl, Ethel Allen, was brutally murdered with Willard Borton having been proven not only to know Ethel Allen and to be with Ethel Allen, but to have been the last person to be seen with this young girl before her murder. Is it possible that Borton's wife and son wouldn't have known of his criminal activities and wrongdoings? Of course. If it were me personally, I think I would know. Willard Borton was finally caught, but this time he wouldn't be escaping. Well, not quite yet, that is, but we'll get to that story a little bit later. Borton had originally entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. I believe this was a recommendation by his attorney because when he decided to withdraw that plea, he said, I am not insane. I know the nature of my acts. After he had said this, his defense attorney promptly asked permission to withdraw as Borton's counsel. This led to Borton pleading with the judge for him to be able to defend himself in court. The judge then denied Borton's request to defend himself. With that decision from the judge, Borton is noted saying, Well, anyway, I want to withdraw the insanity plea and plead guilty to three of the charges because he, quote, 
wanted to get the whole thing over with right now. So, on May 18th, 1939, Willard Borton was sentenced to serve the rest of his life behind bars in the Folsom Prison, one of the nation's first maximum security prisons and California's second oldest prison. Despite the tight security of this prison, and Borton finally willing to own up to his crimes, Borton still could not resist the temptation to escape like he had done so many times before. Not even three years went by when Borton successfully escaped Folsom Prison. On December 4, 1942, three men attempted to escape. Only one was successful. Borton and the two others cut the bars of their cell windows, apparently after filing them down. The other two were captured prior to their escape because they had made too much noise, causing the prison guards to catch them in the act of escaping. Borton, on the other hand, had taken a prison-made rope and lowered himself to the yard below after climbing to the top of the prison. He took a burlap sack and used it to climb over the barbed wire fence at the rear of the prison and use the fog that they had that night to help conceal his escape. He had managed to get about a half mile outside the institution and remained outside for about seven hours. Unfortunately for Borton, prison guards discovered him hiding in some brush, still technically on the prison property. After that, that's all we hear about Willard Borton until October 11, 1949, when Borton's life of crime would have violently come to a brutal and swift end. While at the prison barbershop, where Borton had been working as the prison barber while serving his life sentence, he was slain by three men with a prison-made hatchet and knives. It is reported that they had made three deep cuts around his heart, and the longest of the knives was plunged into Borton's back. He died about an hour after the attack. Apparently, it was reported that Borton had become an informer at the prison, and as a result had made many enemies. What I found most ironic about his murder was that one of his killers, the one who supposedly used the hatchet, was named John Allen. While I could not identify any relation to Ethel Allen, I still thought it was somewhat of a poetic touch. When I first started my many weeks of research for this YouTube video, I was most interested in Ethel Allen. I wanted to make this video a tribute to her. As I was immersed in all the news articles and past of Willard Borton, the alleged killer of Ethel Allen, I found it quite fascinating how someone's life of crime only needed to touch another's life briefly for significant damage to be made. Unfortunately for Ethel Allen, her decision to get involved with Willard Borton, even for the brief time that she allegedly knew him, proved to be the most harmful decision of her life. So. Who killed Ethel Allen? Who is truly responsible? The true answer is that we may never know unless new evidence emerges. Until that hopefully happens, the most likely killer of Ethel Allen appears to be, at least allegedly, as he was never officially found guilty for her murder, our key character of this video, Willard Borton. Was this ultimately due to his father, who had made the decision to operate on his young son's head to help fix what he believed to be the reason of his emerging life of crime? Was Borton simply dealt an unlucky hand in life? How could the once childhood hero of the small New Jersey town sink so low? I think it is a reminder to us all that it doesn't matter how many good things we have done in our lives, all of us are capable of doing great and unfortunately, horrible things. May we all live a life better than Willard Borton. May we all remember to be careful of those we confide in. And may we all remember the life of the sweet young girl whose life was cut far too short, Ethel Allen.